Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering a medical surgical nursing part two. Um, if you haven't watched part one already, that's okay. They really don't go in any particular order, but I do encourage you to go back and uh, cover part one because there are a lot of important concepts that I cover that you need to know for important nursing exams, such as NCLEX, HESI, ATI. Um, before we get started, guys, please don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel, like this video, press that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. Don't forget I have audio lessons available on my website for you, uh, nexusnursinginstitute.com, and you guys can catch me on my other social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Before we get started, guys, I like to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, just go ahead and fast forward. For those that are, please close your eyes by your head. Father God, thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed us once again, Lord, um, to go over information. Father God, I ask that you please help me to deliver this information in a way that every single viewer that's watching this, they can understand. It's palatable enough, Father God, that they can be able to use this information and use these concepts, Father God, so that they can think critically, Lord, when they're taking their tests so they can do well. Lord, I pray for every single viewer, Father God, whatever it is that they came to my channel for, whether they're a student that's trying to pass the program or um, a graduate that's trying to pass the NCLEX or someone who already has their license, but they just want to refresh uh, their knowledge. Lord, I ask that you please give them the information that they need to succeed. And Lord, I tell you, thank you for their support system, whoever they have in their lives that's pushing them and encouraging them, Father God, and telling them that they can do it. Lord, I ask that you get, put a special blessing on them as well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies, Father God. Thank you for even allowing us to be here at this moment, Jesus. Lord, we praise your name and we give you all the glory. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. A nurse is caring for a client with a left hemisphere stroke. The appropriate nursing actions for this client are select all that apply. How do we treat select all that apply? As true or false? Let's go. One, place the food and television on the left side of the bedside table. True. If you go back to the question, it says the patient had a left hemisphere stroke. Remember, if you have a stroke on your left side, the deficiency is going to be on your right. If you have a stroke on your right side, the deficiency is going to be on the left. So since this patient had a left-sided stroke, we're going to put that television, what does it say, television food, we're going to put it on uh, their right side excuse me, on the right side. We're going to put it on their left side because the deficiency is on the opposite side. We want to make sure that they can see their food to eat. We want to make sure that they can see the television. True. To assist the client out of bed on the right side. False. Remember, if they had a left side stroke, the deficiencies on the right side, that's the weak side. So we're not going to um, get them out of bed on the weak side where they can fall. Right? We're going to do it on the strong side, which is the left side. Choice three, raise the left side rail and place the television on the right side. Guys, didn't I just tell you that the right side is a deficiency? So help me understand why um, we're going to put the television on the right side. How are they going to see? Are they going to be able to see well? Remember, whichever side the patient had the stroke, the deficiency, the problem, the weakness is going to be on the opposite side. So that's false. Four, talking to the client's right ear and place food on the right side. <coughs> Excuse me. False. We're going to do it on the left side where it's strong. Choice five, teach the client to pivot on the left leg in and out of bed. True. We want them using what? That strong leg, that strong side, because that's less of a risk for them to fall and injure themselves. So the correct answer, guys, for this question is number one and number five. A nurse notes that a client who experienced a head injury 24 hours ago has returned to the emergency department with slurred speech and is disoriented to time and place. The first nursing action should be, one, continue to assess hourly as ordered, Two, report the change to the physician. Three, repeat a neurological assessment 15 minutes. Or four, notify the operating room of the need for surgery. And guys, the correct answer is two. Report the change to the physician. 
there's possibly increased intracranial pressure, right? And let's say your mind did not even go to increase intracranial pressure. With this situation that they're giving us, we know something's wrong. We know that that patient has gotten worse. It says that they return with now they have slurred speech and dis uh, they're disoriented. Remember guys, whenever you get a test question and the patient's condition has changed, but not for the better, it's changed for the worse, that patient's declining, you got to do something about it. You're going to notify the physician, this patient might have to go into surgery. Look at your other choices. One, continue to assess hourly as ordered. You know what that's saying? Continue to watch them die and do nothing about it. When something's wrong and you choose an answer of continue to assess, continue to monitor, document findings, what you're saying to the test writer is that this patient's dying and I don't recognize it, so I'm just going to watch them die slowly and do nothing about it. Something's wrong. Their condition has changed for the worse. You have to do something about it. So that's wrong. Choice three, repeat a neurological assessment 15 minutes. They're dying, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I'll just check them in 15 minutes. Wrong. Choice four. Stop. Look at choice four. Notify the operating room of the need of surgery. So wait a minute. Let me get this right. So you suspected that patient has intra increased intracranial pressure. You suspect that this patient is going to have to go to surgery, but you're not even going to call the doctor to tell the doctor your findings and you're calling the surgery, uh, the OR to let them know to prep. No, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. That is not within your scope of practice. You're going to report your findings to the physician or the nurse practitioner or whoever, and they're going to make the decision if that patient has to go to surgery and they'll notify surgery, not you. Your job is to um, report these findings. Okay, so the correct answer is number two. Which assessment findings should indicate to a nurse that a client has progression of intermittent, clot of, <clears throat> intermittent clotication? One, the distance the client can walk before leg pain starts. Two, presence of pedal edema in the legs after sitting 20 minutes. Three, changes in strength of peripheral pulses in the affected leg. Or four, changes in skin temperature and color of the feet. And guys, the correct answer is one. Pain, the, excuse me, the distance the client can walk before leg pain. So, Let's talk about intermittent claudication. What is this? That's pain with movement. So what happens is the more that you move around, the more oxygen your body's going to demand because as you're moving, guess what else is moving? Your muscles, those tissues. So they need more oxygen. Remember, oxygen is the food for your body. So this patient who has intermittent claudication, as they're moving, if they're not getting enough of that oxygen that's carried in the blood, they're going to get pain. So number one's the correct answer because if they can walk longer distances without getting pain, the intermittent claudication, it's gotten better. But if they're walking shorter distances and they're getting pain, it's gotten worse. So that's why number one is the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong choices. Number two, the presence of pedal edema in the legs after sitting for 20 minutes. What's, what does that show you? Venous stasis, right? Remember, the vein is supposed to bring blood back up to the heart, but, you know, um, if it's just pooling, that's what we're looking at. Um, well, let me see, presence of pedal edema in the legs after. So pedal edema, that swelling of the legs, what's causing that swelling? All of that fluid, that's supposed to be coming back up, but it's not. So it's staying there in the lower extremities, and that's what's causing um, swelling in the legs. So you would be thinking of venous stasis, but this question is asking us about intermittent claudication. So that's false. Choice three, changes in strength of peripheral pulses in affected leg. Now that would show us, you know, um, peripheral vascular disease, right? So if the patient has, um, if the, the pulse in that lower extremity is not as strong as the other one, right? So that means that most likely that patient has peripheral vascular disease. That's what we would be looking at. But this question is asking us about intermittent claudication. Choice four, changes in skin temperature and color of the feet. What would that really show us? Circulation, right? Remember, um, skin color is supposed to be nice and pink. Why? That pink is supposed is um, caused by the blood, 
right? It's supposed to be nice and warm. That warmth is caused by what? The blood. So if the patient doesn't really have much circulation down there, it's not going to be uh, pink. It may be pale. Or if the circulation is really bad, it may be blue. If the circulation is bad in the lower extremities, instead of being nice and warm, it may be what? Cool. If it's really bad, it'll be what? Cold. Okay? So the correct answer for intermittent claudication is the distance the client can walk before leg pain starts. Which assessment findings should alert a nurse to early alcohol withdrawal in a client two days after surgery? Select all that applies. Guys, how do we treat select all that apply? As true or false? Number one, auditory hallucinations. False. They may have auditory hallucinations with alcohol withdrawals, but we're going to see that later. That's a later sign, not an early sign, because this question is asking us about early. Choice two, decreased blood pressure. False. We expect that blood pressure to what? Be increased. Three, depression. False. That patient's not going to be depressed. They're going to be agitated. Choice four, diaphoresis. Absolutely true. Uh, because of that autonomic um, overactivity, they're going to be what? Sweating a lot. Choice four, tachycardia. True. Absolutely. Again, because of that autonomic um, overactivity, we're going to see the heart rate go up. Choice six, dilated pupils. True. Again, because of the autonomic overactivity, we're going to see dilated pupils. So choices four, five, and six are correct. An older adult attending a community health fair asks about receiving the necessary vaccines for the swine flu. The nurse tells the client that to prevent the spread of swine flu, the client should receive one, just the seasonal flu and the pneumonia vaccines, two, the novel H1N1 vaccine instead of the seasonal vaccine, three, the seasonal and novel H1N1 vaccines the same day, or four, the novel H1N1 and seasonal vaccines a week apart. And guys, the correct answer is three. The seasonal and the new H1N1, same day. And um, that uh, actually offers the very best protection, taking those two on the same day. Let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, look at what number one starts with, just. What is another word? we could use for just where they say just the seasonal um, flu only right didn't i tell you to stay away from those all inclusives only always never unless you know that you know that's the answer and this is not the answer guys right just the seasonal va uh, flu another way of saying that is only the seasonal uh, flu and pneumonia vaccines no two the novel h1n1 vaccine okay instead of the seasonal vaccine no that patient needs to take both on the same day. So that's false. Choice four, the novel H1N1, okay, and the seasonal vaccines, okay, a week apart. False. Again, they need to take both on the same day for the very best protection. A client who had been playing golf in 110 degrees out, uh, outside temperature is admitted to the emergency department with hyperthermia. A nursing assessment would reveal, select all that apply. All right, guys, true or false? One, absence of sweating. True. As that patient moves from hyperthermia to heat stroke, their body mechanisms that would normally have helped keep them cool shuts down. So we won't see sweating. Because when you're hot, you start to sweat, right? That sweat helps cool you off. But as that patient is moving from uh, hyperthermia to heat stroke, those body mechanisms shut down. We are not going to see um, sweating. So number one is true. Two, a decrease in body temperature. False. We just saw that the patient was in 110 degree weather. You think the temperature, their body temperature, do you think their body temperature is gonna go down? No, it's gonna go up. They're gonna be hot. So that's false. Choice three, increase in sweating. Well, I gave you the answer with choice number one. So that's false, guys. Um, they're not going to be sweating. The mechanisms 
that their body normally has to cool them off will start to shut down as they go into heat stroke. So number um, three is, what was I? Number three is false. Um, they won't have an increase in sweating. They'll actually have a decrease in sweating. Choice number four, increased blood pressure. False. As that patient's moving into heat stroke, okay, there are, you're going to see those signs and symptoms of shock. You know what I mean? You're going to see the heart rate go up. You're going to see a blood pressure do what? Go down. Okay, so um, number four is false. We're going to see that blood pressure go down. Number five, I just gave you the answer, tachycardia. True, we're going to see the heart rate go up. And then choice number six, flushed appearance. True, that patient's going to be flushed and dry because remember, they're not sweating. Their body's not producing um, um, th that self-cooling mechanism that normally they would. So the correct answer, guys, is number one, number five, and number six. <coughs> Excuse me. A nurse should recognize the signs of deep vein thrombosis, DVT, if a client reports, select all that apply. We're going to treat them as true or false. Let's go. One, L leg feeling cool with no pain. False. You know in DVT that patient's going to have pain. They're going to have extreme pain. Um, that phlebitis causes the warmth, the redness, the, the, the pain. Okay, so that pa patient absolutely is going to have pain. Number one is false. Number two, numbness of the legs with diaphoresis. False. I just told you they're going to have pain. So how's it going to be numb and they have pain at the same time? It's false. They're, um, it's not going to be numb. And number two, the problem here is with circulation. It's not neurological. So why are they going to have numbness? Absolutely not. That's false. Choice number three, leg swelling with one leg swelling with one leg with dependent edema. Absolutely true. Remember, it's not impossible, but it's nearly impossible. We never see this where a patient has DVT in both legs at the same time, right? It's going to be unilateral. The patient's going to have that DVT in that one extremity. And what happens is that clot is going to obstruct or decrease circulation to come back up to the heart. So that blood it doesn't go back up to the heart. So what happens? It stays, there, it stays there and causes swelling to that lower extremity. So that's absolutely true. The number three, uh, sudden swelling of the one leg with dependent edema. Absolutely. Four, dizziness and blurred vision. False. The problem's not with the eyes. It's with the lower extremity. Choice number five, pain behind the knee with dorsiflexion of the foot. True. We may see that. Now, by the way, guys, long time ago, um, this is called number five that you're seeing. That's called um, Holman sign, right? So it used to be a long time ago if the patient had a positive Holman sign, we're like, oh, that's indicative of DVT. They have a DVT, but not anymore. If the po patient has a positive Holman sign, absolutely. We need to assess them further. We're going to suspect um, a DVT, but it's not 100% indicative of of DVT. However, if we do see a positive home and sign, we should suspect DVT and assess them further. So the correct um, answers for this question is number three and number five. What nursing action is appropriate if a client has a potassium of eight? One, no changes, no changes required in treatment. Two, restrict intake of potassium and or give sodium polycystrine sulfonate, that's KXLate. Three, restrict fluids to reduce potassium. Or four, give insulin, glucose, ca calcium, and or bicarb stat as ordered. And guys, the correct answer is three. I'm sorry, four, just joking. The correct answer is four. We're going to give insulin, glucose, calcium, and uh, bicarb stat as ordered. So let me explain this to you. The insulin, the glucose, and the bicarb, those help move that potassium intracell intracellularly, okay? So that's going to help move the potassium down. Now you see the calcium? The calcium helps protect the heart from the cardiac dysrhythmias that the patient may have because we know 
potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range, guys. 3.5 to 5. 3.5 to 5. That is it. Anything outside of that range, 3.5 to 5, the patient is at risk for having arrhythmias, serious arrhythmias. Okay? So you have to understand why we're giving that calcium. So we're giving the insulin, we're giving um, the glucose and the bicarb because we're trying to bring that potassium down, but that calcium, we're giving it for the heart because the pot uh, the potassium is so high, that patient may have cardiac arrhythmias and that calcium will help protect the heart from those arrhythmias. And that's why we're giving these meds, okay? Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, no ch Really? Really? Are we trying to execute our patient here? This patient has a potassium of eight and we're not gonna do anything about that? Oh, so we, we just kill the patients now. Choice number two, restrict intake of potassium and or give a uh, K-exalate. Here's the thing, um, restricting the potassium, giving K-exalate, that may decrease the potassium, but not fast enough. This patient's potassium is at eight. We need something that's gonna work right now. We can't wait for um, the KXLate to start working. Absolutely not. You know how KXLate works. You know, it binds that potassium. The patient has a bowel movement, comes out, all that good stuff, wonderful. But no, we don't have time for all of that. We need something that's gonna bring the potassium down now. So that's wrong. Choice three, restrict fluids to reduce calcium. No, because um, that patient's not getting that much calcium in the fluids anyway. It's not going to do the job. We need something to bring it down now. Number four is the correct answer. Which statement has the greatest need, excuse me, which client has the greatest need for potassium replacement? One, a client in renal failure with a post-dialysis serum potassium of 3.4. Two, potassium, a client with large NG tube output who's receiving K-exalate with serum potassium of 5.5. Three, a client with cardiac disease who's about to receive furosemide and has a potassium of 3.5. Or four, a client with cardiac disease who's about to receive spironolactone with a potassium of 3.5. And guys, if I'm moving too fast, just press pause. Press pause, look at your questions, think of your answer, and then you can press play whenever you're ready. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is three. A client with cardiac disease who's about to receive furosemide with a potassium of 3.5. Let's talk about this. I just told you that the that potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range and that therapeutic range is 3.5 to 5. 3.5 to 5. In this answer choice, the patient's potassium is 3.5. They're right there at that cusp, right? The lowest you can have is 3.5 and the highest you should have is five, right? This patient has 3.5. Now they're about to get furosemide. What is furosemide, Lasix? What is l -l Lasix? It makes you l -l lose potassium. So this patient has a potassium of 3.5. They're right there on the cusp. Now they're gonna make some, take something to make them lose even more potassium. Uh-oh, they're going to be the one who's going to be most at need for potassium replacement. Because if you're at 3.5, you're right there at the cusp. If you take something that's going to make you lose potassium, that's going to make you drop the 3.4, 3.3, whatever. So that's the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, a client in renal failure with a post-dialysis serum of 3.4. Here's why they're not going to need um, potassium replacement. Even though that potassium is lower than the 3.5. Remember, they have kid kidney failure. They're on dialysis. So guess what? Before it's time for them to go to their next dialysis, that potassium is going to increase. You know that patients who are in, did I say liver failure? If I said liver failure, guys, forgive me. I meant kidney failure. I'm not sure if I said liver. But if I said liver, I meant kidney. Patient who's in liver failure, um, and they're on dialysis, remember, they have to have a low potassium diet because they're already at risk for what? Hyperkalemia. So even though it's 3.4, it's 3.4 because they just had dialysis, it's going to go up on their own. 
they're not going to need replacement. Choice two, a client with large NG output who's receiving k exalate with a serum of 5.5. Normal potassium is supposed to be 3.5 to 5. This patient's at 5.5. They have too much. So they're getting um, k exalate to bring it down. Why would we give them um, extra potassium? Does that make any sense? Absolutely not. So that's false. And then choice four, I like this one. The client with heart disease who's about to get spironolactone. You know what that S in spironolactone stands for? Sparing. Spironolactone is a potassium sparing diuretic. It makes you hold on to your potassium. So when that patient is urinating, they don't lose potassium. When a patient's on spironolactone, they're at risk for hyperkalemia too much potassium. And if you take a look, they're already at 3.5. Your normal potassium should be 3.5 to 5. They're at 3.5 and they're going to be holding on to their potassium. So they're not going to have any problem with potassium. Why are we going to give a potassium replacement to somebody who's taking something that's going to make them hold on to their potassium? Absolutely not. So our only correct choice here, guys, is choice number three. Okay. A nurse knows that the choice of a topical antimicrobial for a client with burns is most influenced by one, bactericidal and fungicidal effectiveness of the agent, two, the form of the agent, whether it's a liquid or cream, three, the presence and extent of scar formation, or four, the ability of the agent to deliver uniform absorption. And guys, the correct answer is three the presence and extent of ASCAR formation. Um, this medication, guys, has to be able to penetrate past that ASCAR. Remember that ASCAR, that, that's the dead tissue, right? It's not viable. So the type of medication that's used, it has to be able to penetrate. And that's why number three is the correct answer. We have to make sure um, it's very important that the medication is not toxic, obviously, but it has to be able to penetrate past that dead tissue, which is what that is scar um, number three is the correct answer. Which condition should a community health nurse report to the health department? One, confirmation of acid fast bacilli. Two, pyretic eruptions from scabies. Three, Lyme disease. Or four, ringworm. And guys, the only one that has to be reported to the state and the state reports to the CDC is number one. What's number one? When you see acid, fast bacilli, automatically your brain needs to go to tuberculosis. That's what we're talking about. By the way, the one way, 100% you can confirm, right? Tuberculosis is not skin test slash PPD slash Montu. It's not chest x-ray, it's sputum culture. We get that sputum and we test it. And what are we looking for? This, acid fast bacilli, okay? So that's the one that you have to report the state and the state reports to the CDC. Now, choices two, three, and four, these are problems. They do need to be treated, but we don't have to report them to the state. Okay, guys, we are down to our last question. Which client can be safely discharged to make room for clients suffering from a salmonella outbreak from a local food chain? One, an 18-year-old diagnosed one day after type 1 diabetes who lives in a college dormitory. Two, a 61-year-old with osteoarthritis who lives in a nursing home. Three, a client who's 48 hours post MI with a WBC of 9,000. Or four, a 70-year-old man with anemia, hematocrit of 39%, oxygen saturation of 90. I'll give you a hint. Whenever you get a test question that asks you who would you discharge first, always look for the most stable patient. The most stable patient. The patient that doesn't have anything acutely happening right now that we would have to address. Who would that be? And guys, the correct answer is choice two. The 61-year-old with osteoarthritis who lives in a nursing home. That is the most stable patient because guess what? That um, osteoarthritis, that's chronic. 
Look at our other choices. One, that 18 year old diagnosed a day ago with type one diabetes. Guys, if you've taken med surge already and you've taken diabetes, you know how much teaching goes into diabetes. This patient has um, lots of teaching, lots of assessment. This, this is not somebody that we're gonna be discharging right away, absolutely not. One day ago, diagnosed one day ago with type one diabetes, no. And they live in the college dorm. Look how young this person is. There's lots of teaching that's going to go into that. Absolutely not. There's something going on with them right now. It's not like they've had this diabetes since they were a child. It's something long-term. So that's false. Choice three, the patient had an MI two days ago. WBCs, 9,000. Uh, CKMB 25, this patient, we can discharge them with home health. They have some continued teaching to go, um, that needs to be going on, but they're relatively, um, um, stable that we would be able to send them home. But still guys, between those two, who is more stable? Our 61 year old. And actually my patient who just had the MI, yes, they had the MI two days ago, but I just... I don't know, I just, I had a brain fart for a moment. Look at that um, WBC. WBC's 5,000 to 10,000. Yes, they're within range, but it's close. They're at that 9,000. They just had that MI. They actually, they can stay some, uh, have some teaching. If number two, let's say number two was not there. We didn't have that patient with osteoarthritis. Number three could have gone. And then we have number four, the patient with anemia. Look at uh, that hematocrit and look at the O2 side. Normally we want that O2 side to be what? 98 to 100. We'll take 95. Patient has 95, we'll take it, but we're more comfortable if it's 98 to 100. That O2 side is 90. Let me tell you something. They dropped to 89 and they're in what? Respiratory, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Respiratory distress. So we're gonna keep that patient Number three, that patient who had an MI, we're going to keep them because number two was there. But if number two wasn't there, we would have sent number three home. And of course, number one, they were just diagnosed. Any patient that needs in-depth teaching or that has something going on with them right now, we have to keep. So that's why number two's got to go, our 61-year-old with osteoarthritis. Guys, oh man, I went over my time. I hope this video was helpful for you. If you want to see more med surge questions, let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to make some for you. I have been reading your comments and I'm making a running list of um, videos that you'd like to see and lessons that you'd like me to make. And I'm trying to get them out for you as soon as possible. Possible. I'm trying to um, produce about two lessons a week, maybe even more. Guys, um, something I wanna ask you, please, if you enjoy my videos, you um, appreciate the content that I'm bringing to you, please share my content. When you share my content and people come on my channel and they watch the videos and they like and they subscribe, um, it helps my channel grow. And when my channel has the support, that allows me to have more time to be able to produce more content for you. Because my goal is to be able to do this for you guys full time every day. I'm trying to get there, but I need you guys to help me. So please share my videos on your Facebook, on your TikTok, on your social media. If you have classmates who you know are struggling and they don't know about me, share my video in the group chat or the WhatsApp. Show my video to your nursing instructor. Please don't forget to like this video, um, subscribe to the channel, press that red notification button. If you're struggling with anything and... Um, you have a test coming up and you really need some extra help, check out my website. I have audio lessons available for you, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And don't forget, you can uh, check me out on my other social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.